but that's part of your walk with Christ, right? Gary? Pray continually. That's what we're advised. What does it mean to pray continually? Does that mean I have to be on my knees for all day long? No. Do you realize that you can pray at any time doing anything? Now, I was running when my son was small. Again, he was on his bicycle and I was running right beside him. And uh, I'm trying to think if I was at the church at that time or not. I don't think I was. No, I wasn't. But this lady had her door open and she had a Doberman pincher. A nice big Doberman pincher. And he comes running out that door. And, you know, they were attracted to the wheels or whatever. I don't know why. But. So all I can see is this dog going right towards my son. So I stepped in front of it, which was not the smartest idea. But, you know, parents make decisions. Luckily, the dog was full grown, but it's still a puppy. The dog came right around me. And at that time, I used to wear my wallet in my back pocket. It came right around and bit me right on my wallet. <laughs> 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 so I turn and I'm looking at this dog. Now, mind you, I'm going to my kung fu instructor's house, which was two houses down. And I was going to kill this dog. Because okay? <laughs> I'm looking at him and he's looking up at me growling as he's biting my wallet. And this lady comes out and she goes, Don't hurt my dog. Don't hurt my dog. <laughs> when the dog came out the door, the first thing I did was I prayed to God. Now, mind you, I wasn't following him, but I knew he was real and I knew he could help me. I prayed to him that my son wouldn't get hurt and that I wouldn't get hurt. And so the dog came right on behind and bit me on. What's the odds of the dog biting you on? Just that right, the, the right part, you see? And not going too far past the wallet, because I wasn't rich then. You see? I'm a slim pickings. But I'm looking at this dog, and this dog's going, Arr! I'm like, Lady, your dog is biting me now. <laughs> she was afraid of the dog. And she didn't want to come get the dog. And the dog looked at me, and I didn't do nothing. And like I said, I, I, wanted, to get, I wanted to hurt this dog. But I didn't do nothing, and I made sure that my breathing didn't get real. You know what I'm saying? Because dogs are able to sense that. And the dog let go, looked at me, I backed off, and the dog went to the lady and went inside the house. Oh, my. It doesn't usually happen. <laughs> One more story of a dog. I said, I, I've, I've run a landscape business since my wife and I have been married. We were going to this one lady's house and she had two uh, king dogs. And, and she had a, it was a block wall that went all around her backyard. She had a swimming pool there uh, that wasn't screened in. And in the back of this yard, probably the wall was it's tall than I was, I'm six foot, so it's probably seven foot tall. Okay. Whenever I went in that backyard, the dogs would drive her crazy because I was in the yard in the park. She didn't care, she let the dogs out. These dogs were not friendly, and they weren't puppies either. So my wife and I are back there, she's got a blower and I got a blower. The door opens, and I'm running from the back, and I run right beside her, tell her the dogs are out, but she didn't hear me because she's blowing. I thought she heard me, so I'm running and I'm outside. <laughs> and I'm angry man for And I'm looking, I'm talking to her, and she's not there. Okay? And so both of these dogies are right there, and the only thing between her is this little hand blower. To this day, she still doesn't forgive me for that. <laughs> I'm like right by her. <laughs> so I tell you all that to let you know that God hears you, because God's. The husband came, and all he had to do, he didn't even speak a word, he just made a noise, and both of those dogs went right back into the house, that quick, because that's what they were trying to do. Okay? Those kind of dogs are scary. God is there, and Jesus promises to never leave you. I can tell you from experience that that is true. He's always with you. Amen. See, that's why I always preach on her, because of this. Amen. <laughs> I talk too much. Yeah. Alright, so verse 6, to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is what? Life and peace. Here's a test. You want to know whether you're carnally minded or spiritually minded? Do you have peace? That peace that passes all understanding. That's one way to 
the sea. If you know God's peace, then you are spiritually minded. But if you have no peace, then you may be carnally minded. Now listen. Gee, hold on. Look at that thought. That doesn't mean your thoughts are all in the world. But you may be under the trap of allowing anxiety to take a place that only God's supposed to be. Amen. Jesus said, don't be anxious for what you're to eat or what you're to drink or what you're to wear because these are the things that the Gentiles seek after. But seek ye first what? The kingdom of God. But if anxiety and worry are constantly there destroying your peace, then your mind's on this world and you're carnally minded. I can do all things through Christ. Right? This, this is part of, of praying without ceasing, in my opinion. It's having an attitude of gratitude. Oh, very well said. Even, even in trials and tribulations. Amen. And you can pray no matter what you're doing at all times of the day, in the midst of anything. Amen. All right, so let's look at... Uh, Let's look at chapter 7, verses 14 through 25. We looked at the law. Verse 14 of chapter 7 says, We know that the law is spiritual. Right? Get that? The law is spiritual. But he says, I am carnal, I'm sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. What I will to do, which is I want to do the right thing, I want to please God, that I do not practice. But what I hate... That I do. Turn with me real quick to Galatians 5.17. And hold your place there in Romans. Galatians 5.17. Here, brothers and sisters, is the battle that you're going to fight from the moment you wake up, even when you're sleeping. says in verse 17 of chapter 5, for the flesh does what? Lust. Lust. Or it wars. The flesh wars against the spirits, and the spirit wars or lusts against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. The only way you're going to have victory over this flesh is by continually walking in Christ, being in His Spirit. Verse 16. Read it. You got it? It says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen. All right, so turn back to Romans chapter 7. Verse 16. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, verse 17, but sin that dwells in me. Verse 18, for I know, this is what I want you to key on. For I know that in me, that is, in this fallen flesh, there is nothing good that dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, that's what I don't find. Verse 19, for the good that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil that I hate, I don't want to do. That's what I practice. Now, if I do what I would not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin who dwells in me. Now, these are a, uh, a bunch of verses that you have to look very closely at and read again and again and again. And if you're reading it from the uh, original King James, good luck with that. Get a... a, a, a a little better English version because these are very deep spiritual applications that Paul's making here. But I'll give you one example of what's being talked about here. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked his disciples to watch and to pray as he went out a little further and he prayed to his Father and he came back and what did he find his disciples doing? And then he went away again. He woke them up. He said, watch. Pray. And he went out again and he prayed. And he came back again and found him doing what? And he made this statement. He said, The spirit is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. 
What did he mean by that, by the example that was given? And what he asked his disciples to do? The disciples, when he asked them to pray, do you think they said, dude, I'm tired, I'm just going to go to bed? No. In their hearts, they wanted to do it, right? But they were living a life that was dictated by the flesh. The spirit of warfare. They, they weren't truly and wholly converted, right? And that's what Jesus was looking for. And this is what is going to make the difference here, is true conversion. And that is that you got to the point where Christ is your all in all, and you're willing to give everything for Him. And that no matter what He asks, how hard it is or how difficult it is, you're willing to say, okay. Do you think if God would have gave Abraham a child 30 years before Isaac was born, do you think he would have gave that child up when God said, take him to the mountain, sacrifice him? It's not a hard, that's, that's not a hard question to no. answer. No. Okay, there was a reason why God had Abraham wait. Abraham had some moral issues. One of them was telling the truth. Right? But Abraham was a friend of God. Is that right? Amen. So you see, the spirit was willing. The flesh was weak. But when it came to the point where Isaac was now a young teenager, that God said, I want you to take your son, your only son, and I want you to sacrifice him to me, that Abraham didn't even question it. Abraham said, okay. That's full, complete, and total conversion. Now listen. What made the difference between Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, they come, they arrest Christ, Peter and John follow closely behind him. John gets Peter in the area where the trial is taking place. John never denies Christ, but yet Peter does three times. What made the difference between that guy, Peter, and the guy Peter on the day of Pentecost. Converted. He was truly converted. What change took place? What did it mean for him to be truly converted? You understand, prior to that time, Peter said, Lord, all of these others may forsake. forsake you. Thank you. Lost the word. But I will never forsake you. I will die for you. Did Peter mean it? Absolutely. Where was Peter from? Galilee. What they said, they meant. The Galilean said something, he meant it. He said he was going to do something, he meant it. Peter wasn't just being boastful, boisterous. What he said, he meant. The problem is, is he said it in the flesh. Amen. And the flesh is weak. And when the test came to him, he got to see the difference between being fully converted and walking in spirits and saying that you're converted and you're walking in the Spirit when really you're walking in flesh. Amen. The day of Pentecost, was that a whole different Peter? Absolutely. When Peter was arrested and he was in jail and he knew he was going to die and he was placed between two guards, what was he doing? Sleeping. He wasn't just lightly sleeping. Because the angel came, and the angel had to actually do what to wake him up? Smoke him. Smoke him. That's a good old King James word. What does it mean? It means he's a him. Straighten him up. Get up, man. He was in such a deep sleep that when he was awake, he didn't know whether this was a vision or whether this was reality. Now let me ask you a question. If you're condemned to die, and you're between two guards, and you're standing and you're sleeping, would you sleep that heavy? That's peace, right? Amen. That's the difference between the unconverted Peter and the converted Peter. No matter what God called him to, no matter where God put him at, he was okay with it. He was at peace and at rest. Mm. All right, so let's finish these real quick. Um, let's go to verse 21. A verse of chapter 7 of Romans. So I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. 
For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, the spiritual man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into what? Captivity. Listen, you're going to serve somebody. Right. As Dylan wrote. You're going to be a slave to somebody. You gotta figure that out now. You're not free. It's not your life. You do whatever you want. Okay? You're either going to be a slave to God and his righteousness, or you're going to be a slave to Satan and his unrighteousness. Amen. But I'd rather be a slave to God because what I found in my personal experience, what I found in my walk with God, is that being a slave to Christ has shown me what true freedom really is. Amen. Amen. I thought I was free before. When, when I wanted to escape the, the yoke of my parents, the control of adults, and I wanted to be free, I thought I was free, what I found is that I was a slave to those things that I was doing, and I had no control of it. At first I thought I could control it, and that's how the devil works. If you think you have freedom, you're tasting these things for the first time, and after a short period of time, it starts to control you. And then it really controls you. And then you are helpless. But in Christ, you're never hopeless. I had people, I had teachers, I had adults, friends, parents. I had friends who thought I was hopeless. Hopeless. But God never saw me as hopeless. Amen. My mother never did either. Because of her, letting me know when I thought, surely God is not going to want me back. Surely God is not going to have any place for me. And she told me that, yes, but you have to trust Him and you have to live for Him. And I did. And He does. And He right now. Now, you realize, that's verse 24, you realize that when he wrote this, there was no uh, chapter divisions. So, it wasn't like he read, he, he said that at the end of chapter 7, and then it took three weeks for him to come to chapter 8. It was automatic, okay? Thinking of what a wretch he is outside of Christ, to who he is in Christ. His, his whole, his... His whole Roman thought was there from right, from from the beginning of the end, though. His, Amen. His, his, Amen. Yeah. See, because what Paul does for the other six chapters is he's getting you to this point, and he's laying the foundation to let you see Amen. that when he comes to this point here in chapter seven, and then to chapter eight, verse one, <laughs> he's laid out the case why this is what it is, why we outside of Christ have no hope, no help. No future, but in Christ, there's no condemnation. God is not angry with us. Okay, so, verse 22, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, here's a question for you. This is where I'll end. For I ask you this question, read chapter 8, verse 1. What does it say? There's no condemnation. Okay, so there's no condemnation, but there is a contingency there for having no condemnation. And it's spelled out very clearly that the contingency of no condemnation, you have to have Christ in you. Amen. Actually, you have to be in Christ. Okay? Amen. So the question is, is at the end of this verse that I thank God through Jesus Christ so that with the mind I serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Is Paul saying that 
I can do whatever I want in the flesh because no. No. for the flesh, I'm just going to serve the law of sin. No. No. This is the difference between what people who in his day were taking his words and turning them to their own destruction and that that teaching is still going on today. It doesn't matter what you do in the flesh. It matters what you do in the spirit because we're spirits and not flesh when we're in Christ. Listen, what Paul is saying here in this verse is, I thank God for Jesus Christ who has given me victory over the flesh. And that I'm not to be carnally minded anymore. I'm not to live in this flesh. I'm not to think the way the world thinks. I'm not to speak the way the world speaks. I'm not to see what the world sees. But I am to be in Christ, a new creation. And that way I am living in the Spirit. And the Spirit controls all of me. Why? Because the flesh has died. It's been crucified. I am crucified with Christ. And yet I live. But it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The closing hymn this morning is hymn number 524. That's 35 minutes, isn't it? 1245 to 1225. Is that 45 minutes? Or 35 minutes? 45 minutes.
we only really make one decision, and that's whom we're going to serve. Lord, this day, by us even being here, we're saying that we want to serve you. I pray that you help us open the door that needs to be opened, that you would come in, because you have never forsaken. We call out to you this day, Lord, on this beautiful and glorious Sabbath day, beautiful sunshine. And this Sabbath is so wonderful. You just make the birds sweeter, the grass greener. I can't wait to see what heaven's going to be like. Amen. Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name.